All right, so let's move on a little bit from Bolero 1 to, I think, you know, another trial that's gotten a lot of play and a lot of interest. Again, we're talking about this before it's being presented, um, and that's uh, the use of neratinib uh, in HER2-positive breast cancer. And let's start with uh, the ExtendNet trial. Um, uh, you know, we, we kind of heard, um, well, actually, no, let's, let's yeah, the, is it ExtendNet? Yes, we'll talk about ExtendNet. And, you know, clearly, um, uh, neratinib uh, appears uh, in these trials uh, to have some benefit. Can someone comment on ExtendNet? You want to start, uh, uh, Edith, uh, on the design? Uh, yeah, th this was an adjuvant trial in about 3,000 patients, uh, and the patients had uh, herd positive, uh, again, early stage breast cancer, and they had received uh, adjuvant trastuzumab, and the patients were randomized to neratinib versus placebo. Uh, the data reported at ASCO are, are based on, uh, the, I think, believe it, two or three year uh, time uh, evaluation of disease-free survival, no overall survival uh, uh, data, as well as subset analysis uh, of some patients uh, related to other markers. You know, I think it was a combination of the, the early signal for improved efficacy by adding neratinib in the context of significant toxicity observed in the clinical trials in the form of, of diarrhea uh, in 90 percent of the patients. Right. So, I mean, I guess the question is that, you know, we may have a trial here um, that after a year of trastuzumab, if you add this oral, you know, anti-HER2 agent that does have significant issues with diarrhea, um, but if it does show a DFS benefit, you know, I mean, again, we're talking not having seen the data yet. Um, again, we're, we've kind of seen a little bit of it, but it hasn't really been formally presented. You know, would that change practice based on uh, what you see? I mean, would it? You know, have any comments there? I, I actually think this is a, a, a remarkable finding. You know, we obviously need to look uh, and dig deep into the data. But um, first of all, it's important to recognize all kinase inhibitors are, are, are not the same. Uh, the, clearly, there's a difference in potency. Uh, for example, you know, the data that uh, emerged from HER2 mutations uh, described by Ron Bose and, and the group at WashU is that in, in these, um, in the in vitro models, there was a difference, for example, between neratinib and lapatinib. Uh, in that there was clear inhibition of these. Now, again, it's hard to extend that into the Extinet study to describe what's going on there, but it, it certainly um, points to the fact that one can alter the natural history, just like with extended hormonal therapy in patients with uh, HER2-positive disease. We know that the outcomes are very good in patients that are treated appropriately with HER2-positive disease, but there are, you know, higher-risk patients, node-positive patients, where you now do get into, you know, 30 percent recurrence risk over time. And this is the group that I think does need a, a newer drug. So, you know, I think it's we're going to have to wait to see the data. The early data is certainly promising, particularly in certain subsets where the, the, the impact is greater. And uh, the diarrhea is an issue that has to be reckoned with. I do know that the protocol was modified to prevent, to use preventive measures for right. diarrhea, to use high dose emodium and, and use very aggressive measures, and that did make a difference over time. Yeah, I, th I think uh, just to clarify, I, I was not uh, involved in the trial, um, but you know, still the I think the studies of the higher doses of emodium were in separate studies that were conducted parallel to to this study. Uh, as far as I know, you may I, th have some I think additional there were modifications made to the study uh, as well. But y y you're right; uh, the, the more recent studies, particularly in combination with Everolimus and uh, yeah. Temsorolimus, uh, <laughs> that, that you uh, rather uh, you, you get significant diarrhea and, and do clearly need prophylaxis. So, is it? Yeah. Of course, yeah, we, we yeah we've been used this drug in the context of HER2 mutations, and I've been very impressed by the fact that prophylactic emodium seems to make this side effect very manageable. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to ask. So this trial was done before that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, I agree with you that no, if, if, this is just a better inhibitor than lapatinib. You know, that's why you have more side effects. I think, <laughs> that's a good point. That's a very track. good point. The other point about that I don't know that I, I, I'm sure this will be commented on the study is that these patients were allowed to stay on hormonal therapy, right. which I think was okay, was, was probably, you know, good. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. No, I think, and that's the, that basically is the standard of care. I think that it would be very rare, I think, for someone in the community to suddenly stop anti-hormonal therapy and just put them on this. But I mean, many well, trials mandate that. I know it does. I think it was very, it was very good on their part to do that. So we'll kind of have to see. I think that it sounds like it's fairly exciting data 
you know, depending on kind of what it shows, it may or may not be practice changing. Again, I think we're talking before uh, we actually see the formal presentation. Um, the other question I have, though, and, and actually that this is potentially a better uh, inhibitor than lapatinib, uh, is this trial, the, uh, I guess it's hard to pronounce it, Nefert? Nefert. The Nefert trial, which is a neratinib paclitaxel uh, versus trastuzumab paclitaxel. It's a randomized phase two. Um, anybody has any thoughts on that? Who've seen it? Joyce, you want to? Um, well, I think it was equivalent in progression-free survival, which is good, but I think the intriguing finding that's in the abstract that we can get access to at this point, at least, right. is, um, and it was good for, they really, and I think it's very smart to do this, they found that patients who had had a history of brain metastasis would come onto the trial with brain metastasis, uh, or those who developed brain metastasis while on treatment was less, it was uh, considerably less with the, nerat the neratinib versus the trastuzumab. And I really think that's a very important thing. You know, we're having trouble enrolling to phase two studies of brain metastasis. A lot of use of SRS, quite appropriately so, because it's a proven therapy for patients. But it's hard to get patients who are act actively progressing and then see them shrink. And so I like mm -hmm. this paradigm where patients who have been treated, let's say, for brain metastasis, unfortunately, we know they almost always come back, you know, and but they're allowed on study. They're followed to see whether on either arm of the study, whether there's less progression. And that's what was seen with neratinib. And goodness, we need that. We need some agents that would be able to prevent brain metastasis. And of course, in the adjuvant setting, it'll be interesting to see what the extranet yeah, study, yeah. once we mm -hmm. have that, you know, to see what the readout will be in terms of uh, brain metastasis. You know, it's a very interesting because, as you know, that was one of the hypotheses, you know, with lapatinib, you know, right. the, uh, with some activity certainly seen in the metastatic setting, especially in combination with, with capsidabine for brain met. And in alto, we did not see a difference in the development of brain metastasis, mm -hmm. which was a secondary endpoint for the patients who received uh, trastuzumab versus those who received uh, trastuzumab in combination with lapatinib. Mm -hmm. right. And in the Cerebell study too, which was actually designed to look yes. at CNS mats with lapatinib versus trastuzumab, again with capecitabine as a, the backbone, no difference in CNS mats. But, you, but that correct. stopped though because systemically it wasn't as good. That's correct. So right, in right. a trial now with this Nefert trial, right. the they're systemically as good, Right? It seems to be the PFS the same. The same. It was the same. It was the same. That's what I meant. Right. No, but it's the same. Yeah. But the brain mets were less. So in other words, maybe if lapatinib right. had been a better, right. you know, it kinase is. Is. inhibitor, then right. it may have worked. And you know, I want to go back to this issue of co-blockade uh, of a hormone and uh, HER2 receptors. I think this we touched on this earlier. But you know, in the going back to the extant that adjuvant study, the, there is a hint there that in the hormone receptor positive group, the benefit was greater. It was a hazard rate of maybe a little over 0.5. And uh, these patients were getting hormonal therapy if they were hormone receptor positive. And it's not something we do in practice. I think many people use hormone therapy once the chemo component is done. But the big question is, can we actually combine hormonal therapy with chemotherapy? We, we've abandoned that in the 80s early on because tamoxifen with chemo was no better, but there were more complications, DVDs. particularly thrombotic complications. Of course, with the AIs, we're not as concerned about thrombotic complications, and I think it is time to revisit that. There have mm -hmm. been some suggestions from neoadjuvant studies that combining chemo and HER2-based therapy with hormonal therapy is better than without in terms of complete pathologic response rate. So uh, I think it's high time that we look at this, uh, revisit it in the metastatic setting. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. No, I think yeah. it's a good point. Yeah. Some of us actually do give hormonal therapy at the same time. <coughs> well, we did do a registry in a registry study. In the right. register study, there was an impact of using Maybe hormonal therapy, and, and that was. Uh... So let's.